1956, I wrote and recorded something we called The Strangest Secret. Without advertising or fanfare of any kind, it outsold all other non-musical, non-entertainment type recordings. It's been heard by millions and millions of people throughout the free world and in the process created a brand new industry. Learning through listening. On one of these solid state cassette tape players. This player has revolutionized the learning process. Now people listen in their automobiles while driving to and from work and on sales calls, time that was formerly wasted, on their commuter train with the little earpiece, in the bathroom while shaving in the morning, uh, at the dinner table with the children gathered around the table and the whole family together for a change. This has made a tremendous difference in the business of learning. But getting back to the strangest secret, what makes a bestseller? What was there about that recording that caused millions of people to want to hear it over and over again and let their children hear it and play it for their employees and their sales forces? Well, I'm making a talk here today in which I'll cover the highlights and philosophy of the strangest secret, and I'd like to invite you to join us, and I hope you find it of some value. interesting story in the world. Why a person becomes the person he becomes. Why a little boy or a little girl grows up to be the kind of person he or she becomes. Now the estimates by the experts in this field are that most of us are using somewhere around 5% of our real potential. Some experts say as little as 1%. It means that we're only giving about 5% of ourselves to what we're doing to our days, our work, our families, everyone we know, our entire environment. But it also means that we're only experiencing 5% of the fun, 5% of the joy, 5% of the rewards we could be knowing, or less. All the experts are agreed that in each of us, there are deep reservoirs of ability, even genius, that we habitually fail to use. Why? We know that most people desire by nature to succeed. But what is success? What is this word that has become so famous in the world? What does it mean? Most people don't know what success is all about. And since they don't know what it's about, they really don't know where to look for it. Success is really nothing more than the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. This means that any person who knows what he's doing and where he's going is a success. Any person with a goal toward which he's working is a successful person. This means that the boy in, in high school who's working toward a diploma, or the boy in college toward a degree, is just as successful as any human being on earth because he knows what he's doing, why he's getting up in the morning, and where he's going. But conversely, if a person doesn't know what he's working toward, what it is he wants, doesn't have a goal toward which he's working, then he must, at least by this definition, be called unsuccessful. Why isn't then, with this simple definition, why isn't everyone successful? It should be easy. Yet surveys indicate that 19 out of 20, 95% at least, are not. In fact, a survey one time asked thousands of working men why they got up in the morning and went to work, and 19 out of 20 didn't know. 19 out of 20 working people didn't have the foggiest notion of why they got up in the morning and went to work. Under closer questioning, they said, well, everybody works. Well, that would be a good reason to quit. In fact, here's a little rule of thumb you might want to remember. Whatever the great majority is doing under any given circumstance, if you do exactly the opposite, you'll probably never make another mistake as long as you live. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. The problem with most people is that they're playing the world's most unrewarding game. And the name of the game is Follow the Follower. There's a story about a small town in which there was a jewelry store, and like all jewelry stores, uh, or most jewelry stores at least, he had a big clock in his window. And every morning for years he'd noticed a working man stop, adjust his pocket watch to the same time as the clock in the window. He'd been doing this for many years, and one morning the jeweler was out in front sweeping a sidewalk, and so he asked the man, he said, tell me, why do you uh, adjust your watch to my big clock every morning? I've noticed you're doing that for years. 
The man said, well, I'm the foreman down at the big plant. He said, I want to make sure my watch is correct because I blow the quitting whistle every night at 5 o'clock. The jeweler looked at him rather strangely for a minute. He said, well, well, that's funny. He said, I've been setting that big clock in the window by that quitting whistle all these years. A very logical thing, but they could have been off six months. It was a case of a person just going along with what he thought to be correct without checking his references. So I want to suggest that from now on out, at least we do that. That we check our references and ask ourselves, are the people I'm following going where I want to go? Let me tell you the story of what we might call the average young man in our society. Now, from the time this boy is born, there's only one thing on earth he can do, and that's to begin to think, act, and talk like the people by whom he's surrounded. This is all in the world he can do. But right off the bat, the odds are 95 to 5 that he's thinking, acting, and talking like the wrong group. They're wonderful people. They love him. They'd do anything in the world for him. They want him to succeed. But the odds are 95 to 5 they haven't got the answers he needs if he's to reach fulfillment as a human being. If he's to reach this success that he wants. If he's to reach into these deep reservoirs of ability and genius we know he possesses and draw it out. Well, he starts in school. The most important thing to a little boy in school is to be liked by the other little boys in school. And so at this tender age, he begins to follow other little boys his same age who don't know any more than he knows and who do not necessarily have any capacity for leadership. And he does this in the first grade, and the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, and the eighth, and year after year after year, he forms himself into a composite average of other little boys his age, trying to be like them, trying to do the only thing in the world that's impossible for a human being to do, which is to be like somebody else. Now, let's say he goes all the way through school, usually goes in the military service. Again, he's caught in a vice-like grip of conformity. Now, let's say he's 25 years old, out of school, out of service. What's he going to do? As a rule, uh, he'll go back to his hometown, unless he's married, in which case he'll go to his wife's hometown. But let's say he goes back to his own hometown, he's single, he doesn't know quite what to do, and he's standing on a corner one morning, and a friend that he knew in school comes up and says, Hi there, uh, Charlie, what are you doing? He says, Nothing. He says, Why don't you come down and work where I work? It's a pretty good place, the pay's regular, we got all kinds of fringe benefits and so on, and so he does. The odds are about, again, 95 to 5, that his first job is taken as a result of random application. On the job, without thinking about it, the most natural thing in the world for him to do is to look around and see how the other guys are doing their job and to begin doing his the same way, assuming that what is normal for them is normal for him. No reason for this. He doesn't think about it. He just does it. Now, he has stretching in front of him 50 years or more in the golden age that man has been dreaming of since the days of ancient Greece. What's he going to do with these 50 golden years?